Good morning. Thank you guys for attending the results presentation for the value of balanced growth for transportation presented by Ms. Kirby Date of Cleveland State University. Please, if you're on the phone and you don't have a mute button, you can mute your phone by pressing star six. Conversations and hold music tend to be heard by everybody and give feedback, so please mute your phone. Um, questions will be held to the end of the presentation. And if you are attending via webinar, in the bottom left hand of your screen, you should have a box to be able to type your questions. And at the end of the presentation, we'll read those. And with that, I'll just turn it over to Kirby Date. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Kirby Date. I am a professional planner uh, representing the Maxine Goodman Levin College of Urban Affairs at Cleveland State University. Uh, this was a collaborative project uh, between the Levin College of Urban Affairs and the Washkowitz College of Engineering at Cleveland State. And we also had CDM Smith, a uh, consulting firm, assisting us on the project. Um, just briefly, uh, it was truly a collaborative project. As you will see as we go along, there were uh, really a, a number of people who played really strong roles. Um, I was the leader of the planning team uh, with the Levin College. Jacqueline Jenkins uh, was leader of the engineering team over at Washkowitz College. Um, and uh, Jacqueline is here with me today uh, so that we can work together on this and also uh, available for questions. Uh, Dr. Wendy Kellogg um, was also assisting in, from the planning side. Uh, Suzanne Rhodes is with us today. She uh, is a planner with CDM Smith, uh, engineering consulting firm. And Catherine Hexter, Charles Post, and student assistants were also involved in the project. The objectives for this research uh, were, were really uh, one primary overarching goal, which was to assist ODOT with understanding the relationship of transportation decisions to land use policy, uh, supporting transportation benefits, um, in particular efficiency and effectiveness. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So we had four objectives for the project that really paralleled the process that we went through in, in pursuing it. Um, we started with a broad literature review. Uh, we were interested in understanding uh, balanced growth programs, both in Ohio and across the country, and uh, research in this area, as well as modeling methods and policy recommendations. Um, we then uh, collected data and uh, analyzed that data. Uh, using new data that we collected to evaluate the relationship of land use to transportation patterns um, and policy. Uh, and then at the end, we looked at um, a broad review of policy across the country and how the literature demonstrated the connection of policy to land use. So basically what we have here is uh, the question is, how does policy influence land use? And then how do land use patterns influence transportation outcomes? So it's sort of a two-step connection that we were exploring. Um, and just a brief overview of the literature is what I will start with. Um, we looked at a number of things. We looked at just the broad range of types of land use policies that are in use. And we classified those into tiers for ease of anal analysis. Um, we looked at the Ohio Balanced Growth Program itself and various other balanced growth type programs in other states, um, did an inventory of those programs in each of the states. Um, and then uh, the literature review involved a pretty in-depth read of uh, a wide range of issues related to the land use and transportation connection, um, from methodologies and land use and transportation measures to cost to commuting times and distances, trip rates, mode choice, uh, vehicle miles traveled, congestion and travel delay, and then emissions and vehicle collisions. So we classified the transportation benefits into three major areas. Um, and you will see this sort of classification go through um, as, we, um, as we looked at these um, various measures. Transportation effectiveness basically um, we looked at 
lane miles. A transportation benefit of a land, of a land use pattern would be reduced lane miles. Um, we use lane miles, so you'll notice on this page, the blue are the areas that we um, basically specifically measured in our technical analysis. And uh, lane miles is, uh, uh, we felt, a pretty good connection to reduced construction costs and reduced ma maintenance and operations costs. You have less lane miles to maintain, then you're going to have lower costs. Um, under transportation efficiency, we looked at reduced vehicle miles traveled per capita. Um, we looked at reduced congestion, delay, and travel times. And along with that, then, other benefits that can, can be part of that, increased opportunity for optimization of transit and other modes, and reduced peak travel demand. Um, under economic and community transportation benefits, we look specifically in our analysis at increased safety and reduced emissions. Um, but at the same time, there are many other sort of broader ripple effect transportation benefits that come from land use patterns um, represented, uh, including better access for non-drivers, improved transportation choice for everybody, reduced fuel consumption. So these all fall out of the basic measures that we looked at. Um, local maintenance jobs, um, reducing transportation costs to all sectors of society, um, reducing local highway capital and maintenance costs. And then where you're doing more compact land use patterns, you're going to see um, redevelopment, a greater emphasis on redevelopment areas, which means that the overall tax base goes up. So we wanted to talk a little bit about this concept of the balanced growth type program. Um, these are programs that basically attempt to create increased density and compactness in development areas, increased redevelopment and infill of existing areas, nodal patterns of development, which is basically um, development that's more focused on specific locations rather than being spread out evenly. So it's got a um, centering factor to it. It's weighted towards certain centers. Um, and then prioritization of development and conservation areas. These are all characteristics of the overall goals of the Ohio Balanced Growth Program, and, of, and that's what we've looked for in other programs in other states. There's a very wide range of programs in other states. So we looked for these fundamental characteristics as the goals. These are the characteristics of land use patterns that, that will lead to transportation benefits. And so that's what we were looking for. One area of confusion people often have is they don't, they think that because a state requires planning, requires communities to plan, it requires MPOs to plan, um, they think, and, and this can be often very politically difficult to do, uh, they think that therefore that community or that state or those communities are headed for smart growth. And that is not really a criterion. You can plan to do excellent sprawl. So um, we wanted to make the distinction that we were not specifically looking for states that required planning. We were looking for states that attempted to influence the density and the nodality of the land use patterns that, that developed. So then when we looked at the range of policies themselves, for the purposes of our analysis, we grouped them into four basic categories. Um, so this is at the state level, and then as we looked at focus MSAs, we reevaluated for individual MSAs. Tier zero policy is basically states and areas that have no balanced growth type policy at all. They are not attempting to influence the density and the nodality of land use patterns. Tier one are um, states and areas that attempt to influence those patterns through voluntary incentive-driven programs. Um, so they, they might be supporting those programs through education, resources, and technical assistance. They might be aimed at either public or private investment or both, but the overriding factor is that they are voluntary and incentive-driven. And this is where the Ohio Balanced Growth Program falls. Um, tier two are states in particular, a couple of regions do it, but the states that have either mandatory or rigorous policy affecting state and sometimes regional agency policy investment and prioritization. So what they are trying to do is influence 
the decisions that government agencies, public decisions, and investment, public investment decisions that could have an influence on land use density and nodality. Um, and then tier three is really the wide sweeping policy. This is mandatory or rigorous policy that affects state, regional, and local decisions, and therefore it controls both public and private investment. So uh, if a private um, developer wants to develop, they need to comply with these overall policies that require more densification and more nodal development patterns. So we reviewed the policy across the 50 states. And what we found was that 24 of them, and I just gave you some examples, instead of listing all of them, I just gave the ones that are in the immediate area of Ohio, um, uh, with a couple exceptions. So tier 0, 24 of the 50 states fall into that category. Uh, tier 1, which is the voluntary incentive-driven programs, 11 states fall into that category, including Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Minnesota, and Kentucky. I note that Colorado is also, according to our criteria, now a tier one. It was formerly a, di a different tier. It was a higher uh, tier two to tier three. Um, but policies do change over time. Emphasis changes over time. Um, but so we're, this is a 2014 sort of designation. Tier two, there were 13 states, including New York in our immediate area, and also a number of others. Um, and that one we saw some changes in the last few years. Uh, some states have actually moved up to a tier two. Tier three, um, there are right now two states, Oregon and Washington, that have long-standing tier three policies, most famously the urban growth boundaries. You can see that tier three is, as I said, long-standing. Oregon's uh, policies went into place in 73, and Washington's in 1990. So these are just a couple of examples of the Tier 1, 2, and 3 policies. Um, in Tier 1, we see states with priority development and conservation areas that have attached incentives, incentives for projects that are aligned with those policies and priorities. Um, they might also have things like streamlined approval processes, provide support and funding for open space and historic resource conservation. They might provide technical assistance or public education great web resources, research support, that kind of thing in, in the states that are Tier 1. Tier 2 have a state or regional guide plan. And that plan includes policies that, that aspire to more dense, more nodal development patterns. Um, what happens in Tier 2 is that state and regional agencies who are, who are basically spending state funds are required to align with that state guide plan. Um, they also, a number of the states have specific language about eliminating subsidies to non-aligning programs and policies. So they're looking at it from two perspectives. Um, tier three then have a state guide plan, and they require everybody to comply with it. That's state agencies, regional agencies, and local governments. Often they have both state offices that um, actually review local plans and codes and ensure that they are in compliance. Um, this often involves mandatory urban growth boundaries and service areas. Um, as we will see in a few minutes, we do have one MSA level region that has a very aggressive open space acquisition policy, and that is essentially acting as a tier three policy in that one region. So general findings in the literature, just to sum up, um, and of, of course in the report itself there's extensive documentation of this. Uh, less dense developments require more lane miles per dwelling overall. Transit-oriented developments, which are more dense developments focused around transit uh, stops and stations and lines, are associated with fewer vehicle trips and greater transit share. There is a better, where there is better jobs housing balance, i.e. more mix of jobs and housing together around nodes, uh, they are associated with lower vehicle miles traveled and commute times. Mixed use developments, again, that are mixing shopping and residential and office or um, work environments, 
uh, provide an opportunity to reduce trips, providing a pedestrian alternative for some trips, and reduced number and length of trips are associated with reduced emissions and increased safety. Um, that one, last one is, is obvious, but it has indeed been verified in the literature. So now I'm going to move into part two um, of the study, which uh, is basically data collection and analysis. Um, the steps we went through, we identified 26 metropolitan statistical areas across the U.S., and then we collected data on those, both quantitative and qualitative. We conducted analysis on that data via scatter plot and regression um, analysis. We also did a visual assessment of tier patterns in those scatter plots. Remember, the tiers are the different types of policies. So in that evaluation, we attempted to put policy, land use, and transportation outcomes together in one sort of visual um, analysis. Um, and then, of course, we, we concluded with some results, which I will go over. Um, and for those of you who are unfamiliar, a metropolitan statistical area is a U.S. Census regional-based designation. It's usually multi-county, and it's based on census tracts. So data collected on the MSA basis lines up with um, census data. And, and so it, it, it's a, we have a, a, a match there in terms of um, aligning data with other sets of data. We used a specific set of selection criteria in order to identify those MSAs. Um, working on behalf of uh, the state of Ohio, we were very interested in making sure that we identified MSAs that would have parallels to the kinds of conditions and communities that we find here in Ohio. So the first cut was that um, as we reviewed, we found two studies that had good data that was pretty consistent that we felt we could use for the analysis. So the first cut was that we identified the MSAs that had data available both from Ewing's 2014 Sprawl Index Study, and I'll, mention, I'll go into a little more detail on that in a minute, and the Texas A&M Transportation Institute Urban Mobility Study. Both of those were based on 2010 data. Then we excluded very large metro areas, New York and Boston, and anything that was over seven counties, just because that we don't have any conditions like that in Ohio. We excluded states with unique planning frameworks. Hawaii and Vermont have a completely different basis for how their planning law works, um, and um, we didn't feel that we would have comparable uh, situ conditions to compare those. Um, we chose uh, MSAs that have a range of scores on a sprawl index, the Ewing sprawl index, which I'll explain in a moment. We also looked at growth rates, um, both in population and GDP, and we chose MSAs that had a range of positive, neutral, and negative growth rates from 1990 to, uh, actually it was 2010. That's a typo. Um, and then uh, we chose uh, MSAs that had a range of state-level tier policies, uh, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So that was a little bit of a puzzle, getting those selected. Um, then we added, we wound up with 21 non-Ohio communities or MSAs, and then we added to it all five Ohio MSAs that had data in the first two uh, studies. So these, the, here's a list of the selected um, MSAs, I will not uh, read the whole list to you. We'll be talking about individual MSAs as we go through the results. Uh, there were 14 states represented, and uh, Ohio had five. Um, Texas, which because of the uh, Texas A&M uh, study, also was highly represented with four, um, and most either had one or two. Really wide range of, of MSAs. Our data collection in, in, um, included a really wide range of data, both qualitative and quantitative. We looked at sprawl index values, uh, land use data, travel network and congestion data, emissions, collision data, and then other data. We did uh, visual map reviews. We looked at vehicle ownership, um, housing growth by decade in order to see if there were patterns in when the sprawl happened or when development happened in terms of how uh, the land use patterns fell out, uh, GDP growth, and so on. Um, so the actual data um, sets that we looked at or the focus, I don't know what you would call those, um, 
Uh, under transportation effectiveness, we looked at total lane miles per million people. We also uh, looked at that at the freeway and the arterial level. Um, under transportation efficiency, we looked at trip rates and mode choice, basically transit annual passenger miles. We looked at daily VMT for freeway, arterial, and total. We looked at congestion and travel delay, basically annual hours per capita and per commuter. Under uh, community and economic benefits, we looked very simply at emissions and at safety uh, as those two directly relate to transportation benefits. So I want to talk for just a minute about the sprawl index because it's a very important part of the analysis. It forms the x-axis of the scatter plots that we were looking at. Um, Reed Ewing and uh, colleagues uh, completed two studies, um, one round in 2002 and 2003 based on 1990 and 2000 data, and one um, in 2014 that was based on 2010 data. Um, and that study had more of a health focus. It was done with a couple of health institutes. Um, they started with a principal component analysis in 2003 of 83 MSAs across the country. When they redid the study in 2014, they looked at 193 MSAs. And they also looked at the county level. Um, and so their papers include a lot of data at the county level. We, um, because of, of, of alignment of data and, and wanting to look at broad patterns, we focused on the MSA level. What they did was they consolidated 22 different land use variables into four factors. Density, land use mix, degree of activity centering, which is that nodality factor I was talking about, and street accessibility. Um, and then they rescaled those factors to arrive at a composite score with a mean value of 100 and a standard deviation of 25. Um, the range for 2014 for the lowest, and this is an important point, the lowest uh, sprawl index of all the MSAs they looked at in 2014 rated at 45. Um, and that's the most sprawling. So the lowest number is the most sprawling. The highest went up to 425 with the least amount of sprawl. And that's at the MSA level. Um, their study in 2014, I should note, also updated the definition. So those 22 variables organized into four factors were slightly, a couple of the, the variables were adjusted a little bit um, as they defined their four factors. The study factors um, are important because they describe land use patterns. Um, under density, they used various population density and lot size measures as a composite to form the density factor. Um, under land use mix, they used job, shopping, school, population measures, and then various measures of their relationship to each other, so shopping and residence, and jobs and residences, and so on, and then combine those to, into the land use mix measure. Um, degree of activity centering, they looked at coefficients of variation in density, distance to centers, population density gradients, and combine those into a factor. And then under street accessibility, they were looking at block lengths, block sizes, and the percentage of small blocks in a particular area, and again, combining those. And then they developed a composite factor out of those four, which is the main single factor that we're using in our analysis. So just, I'm going to show you some visuals here to kind of get a handle on what exactly we're talking about. These two photos are from the um, sprawl study. They're aerial photos from the Ewing study. And you can see there on the upper area the, the MSA, actually it's the county, with the highest sprawl index at 425.2. The least amount of sprawl is New York County, New York. On the low end, the area with the lowest sprawl index at 45.5 was Oglethorpe County, Georgia. So you can see the difference in land use pattern here, even visually, in terms of the amount of open space and development. Um, in our study, our low MSA was Knoxville, Tennessee, with a sprawl index of 68.2, with the most sprawl. And our study high of the MS 26 MSAs we looked at was Madison, Wisconsin at 
Um, I guess the points to notice here are that Knoxville, let me see if I can use this. Knoxville is actually quite linear. This photo was a close-up. The amount of linear development you see here goes, uh, goes out in the other direction as well. Um, and then down here in Madison, you can note the, um, the two lakes, which really constrain development. Development's focused along the strip between them and then around the two sides of the main city area is here. Okay, just for interest, I wanted to highlight the, um, the areas that are the tier threes and that have our highest ratings on the sprawl index. Eugene, Oregon has an urban growth boundary. And you can see it in the aerial photo. Notice here the very defined edge we have to development. Um, and then development stops, and you've got the countryside with very, very little development at all. Um, this um, was put into place in 1973. So it's really had quite a long time to, to have an effect on development patterns. In Spokane, Washington, Washington's our other tier three state, these policies went into place in 1990. You can see similarly we have still a fairly well-defined edge, but perhaps not as well-defined as in, as in Oregon. Um, our two high-end states, uh, however, our two high-end MSAs are not in uh, tier three states. They're Wisconsin and Milwaukee. And so the question became, well, what is it that's giving them such a high sprawl rating? Um, and it's, it's difficult to tell, to be honest. And we'll talk about that a little bit as we go into the scatter plots. But you can see that there, the lakes here have a confining effect on the extent of development in Madison. And in Milwaukee, we do have a confining effect also. This is Lake Michigan along here. However, it's only on one side, and we also have other MSAs with a lake or a river constraining development that don't have high sprawl ratings. So it's a little more difficult to tell what exactly might be driving those, those sprawl ratings there. One other MSA that's of particular interest in this category is Boulder, Colorado. Boulder, Colorado is officially, according to our assessment, a tier one state, um, very uh, more in incentive driven, voluntary type policies. And yet, Boulder is surrounded by a green belt. This is the outskirts of the Denver developed area, which is Denver down this way. And we have this large green swath here um, between Boulder and Denver. We also have all this undeveloped mountain area here. And what we basically have found is that in Boulder, no, there's not mandatory policy, but there has been an aggressive land acquisition policy since 1898 in that county. Um, there are eight different government entities that have acquired open space in up to 15, using 15 different mechanisms from purchase to conservation easements to various other designations. So that aggressive policy is effectively acting to constrain development as well. Um, in Ohio, the, um, one of the lowest uh, rated, you know, that we're much more moderate here. We don't have the low lows or the high highs, but we have more moderate MSAs. One of the lowest is Columbus at 93, you can see here. And then um, Akron, which is one of our highest at 103, um, is similarly, uh, you know, there, visually there's not a lot of difference between these. Um, and and what I will talk about in a few minutes is that there are obviously many other factors that go into determining land use patterns besides simply um, policies that are in place. And a lot of the land use policy we see is in place very recently um, and may not have had much time to take effect. So here's this, uh, the first of our scatter plot analyses that we use to kind of look at the relationship of land use to transportation outcomes. That's the scatter plot location. Each of these um, points is a um, uh, uh, and is one of the MSAs. The first two letters are the state that the MSA is located in. So you'll see TX-B is uh, Texas Beaumont. 
and the, the, the second letter after the dash is the first letter of the actual identifying area. I know. I want to make a couple of other points here. So what we have is freeway lane miles per million people on the y-axis, and we have the sprawl index on the x-axis here. So this is that sprawl index we've just been talking about. And um, this thing. So this is the sprawl index we've been talking about. And then up here we have the freeway lane miles. As expected, the regression line runs uh, lower, so you have lower lane miles. The higher you go with um, the sprawl index, this was uh, shown to be significant uh, based on linear regression. Um, overall, if you look, you'll see that the tiers are um, really somewhat scattered. We do have a cluster of tier three. Those are the blue dots. So they do tend to cluster, and you will see that cluster happening in many of the plots. Um, um, Colorado, Boulder, which is that other possible tier three-ish uh, MSA is also clustered in that vicinity. So that's one pattern. Another pattern to notice is that in general, states cluster along the sprawl index. So you will see the Texas group are roughly in the same area of sprawl. The Ohio's have tended to be along the sprawl index, clustered in the same vicinity. The Connecticut. This one doesn't have a symbol, but the Connecticut's are close to each other. Um, so that is another pattern that, w that we note um, uh, that, that shows up from time to time. I should also mention that we also, I'm not going to show you the scatter plot here, but we also studied arterial lane miles per million people. Um, there, um, that analysis was not shown to be significant. Um, the outlier was Spokane, Washington. So there, the cluster of tier threes did not line up. Spokane was up here somewhere. And um, Beaumont, Texas, which is uh, in the group here, was also an outlier up here in that analysis. Um, just a couple of examples. Little Rock is our outlier up here, right, way above the group, and uh, with much higher lane miles. Um, and uh, as you can see, it's really an, an area that has very little geographic constraint and is very spread out along, um, very spread out along one long corridor here um, and another corridor that looks like it goes up along the river here. So that seems to have had uh, some influence on its sprawl index and its lane miles. In Laredo, where we had um, relatively uh, low, in fact, this was the low outlier, was Laredo, Texas, I want to introduce you to this area. This will show up again uh, in other scatter plots. Laredo is right on the Texas-Mexico border. And you can see the Rio Grande here. So Laredo, Laredo is constrained up against that international border. The data only looks at uh, Laredo itself, the United States side. Notice the density and intensity of development on the Mexico side. So we could say, well, one of the reasons they have fewer freeway lane miles is they are constrained by that international border. On the other hand, Buffalo, New York, which is similarly constrained against the Canadian border, you can see the Niagara River here, um, falls right in the middle of the pack and is not an outlier at all. So that obviously is not a clear, strong indicator of what is going on here. So just a quick summary, I've mentioned most of these things already. The one thing I want to mention um, on this slide is confounding factors. What we found over and over again in this analysis is that there are obviously a number of other things going on in each of these slides. Things like market conditions being different in different MSAs, different population and household characteristics, different jobs and housing locations, not just the mix, but the locations of them can affect the transportation factors the size and configuration of the MSA. External travel demand was not addressed in this at all in terms of identifying uh, what, who might be coming through that area from outside um, and the overall level of transportation investment. Those were outside the scope of this study and very easily could be um, contributing in a big way to the outcomes of these scatter plots. All right, next one we looked at, public transportation annual passenger miles per capita. Um, you will note here 
a, uh, this was one of the two areas that was not significant. We do have a general trend up, as you might expect, um, where the passenger miles increase with the sprawl index, but lots and lots of scatter in terms of outliers and in terms of policy. Um, the the uh, Tier 3 cluster does not even hold here. We have um, Oregon, Oregon and Washington. They're pretty far spread from each other. Um, and so that really everything's very broad spread and mixed up. Of interest, um, Pittsburgh is at the high level in terms of the highest um, passenger annual miles per capita, and our lowest is Beaumont, Texas. So Pittsburgh itself, um, it's hard again to discern what could be driving this, but the fact that development is uh, organized along the three rivers could possibly contribute to a more convenient transit system that could generate higher ridership. Um, and beyond that, it's really difficult to tell what could be driving that here. Um, in Beaumont, we have a very spread out community. Um, you can see uh, somewhat linear in development pattern and, and uh, no real geographic restrictions. So again, that is um, Probably there are many factors that work here in determining what that ridership is about. I mentioned most of these things. Again, the non-land use factors here, things like transit convenience versus auto use, uh, overall transit investment, job housing locations, weather, uh, market demand, social desirability of using transit, and household and population characteristics are all going to be drivers that were not part of this study that would possibly help to explain some of the patterns we saw. Okay, another factor we looked at, daily vehicle miles traveled. Um, this one did uh, come out as significant. Um, you can see the um, general expectation that we would have, um, as the sprawl index went up, lower VMT was indeed uh, shown in the study. Um, and uh, we do have a cluster here of the Tier 3 states. And uh, in fact, Boulder, Colorado also falls into that cluster in terms of lower VMT. And of course, our two Wisconsin states are right in the ballpark there with those. Um, outliers include um, uh, Texas and Laredo are pretty, or I'm sorry, Texas and Little, or Beaumont, Texas and Little Rock are um, pretty far outside of that. And our low down here is uh, Boulder and Laredo um, have very uh, low VMTs for the group. Um, I should mention that this was one area where the other two we studied, freeway daily VMT, um, that scatter plot looks almost like this one. Every, the, you know, the locations are slightly different, but the patterns are pretty much the same. However, arterial daily VMT had significantly different patterns. Um, Beaumont, Texas, was located way down here for freeway and way up here for arterial. Um, and a number of these guys, um, Grand Rapids, Michigan, moved up in terms of higher VMT. And um, Laredo, Texas, moved up closer to the regression line. OK, just another view of Beaumont. And um, the summary here, again, Confounding factors are most likely at work here to explain all of this. So really the patterns were very, um, uh, in terms of policy, were less, less prominent except for that tier three cluster that shows up uh, again and again. Okay, annual hours of delay per commuter. Um, we also looked at annual hours of delay per capita. And again, this one was virtually the same, very, very similar patterns. Here we did not have so much in terms of pattern. We did see a uh, significant regression analysis, and we saw a line that, as expected, reduced. So the hours of delay would reduce as communities went up on the sprawl index. Um, however, very wide range of scattering, and the policy tiers were scattered as well. Um, even the uh, tier threes, Oregon, Washington, and then we have Eugene, Oregon down here, were um, pretty widely scattered from each other on the delay index. Um, 
of interest, Eugene, Oregon is a uh, college town. Maybe that had something contributing to the uh, to the lack of, um, you know, to the lower delay. <clears throat> so um, I should should show you again up here. Our high for this rating was um, Connecticut, Bridgeport, and our low was Stockton, California. So I have illustrations of both of those. In Bridgeport, you can see this is really part of the New York metropolitan area, so delay is kind of part of the definition, I think. Um, this intensely developed area in Connecticut is right up against Long Island Sound. And Stockton, California, on the other hand, at the low, um, you know, in appearance, appears to be um, fairly intensely developed um, and uh, pretty spread out. There, you know, very few geographic constraints in the development there. So hard to say why the delay would be lower there. I'm just going to skip over that. That's really basically what I just talked about. Sulfur dioxide per million people really represents the emissions group that we looked at. We looked at sulfur dioxides per million people, nitrogen oxides per million people, and volatile organic compounds per million people. And um, um, I would see and say in general the differences between them are that the outliers for um, nitrogen oxides were distinctly different from the sulfur dioxides group. And um, volatile organic compounds uh, pretty much paralleled the sulfur dioxides, but was the groupings were looser, a little more spread out. Um, uh, this does really roughly parallel the d daily vehicle miles traveled, as would be expected. Um, emissions did. However, confounding factors are probably a number of them, the most prominent being the differences in industrial emissions from, from area to area that have um, very little to do with uh, transportation outcomes. So in Albany, I believe Albany was um, up here. Let me see. This was our high, Albany, for sulfur dioxides, and our low was Laredo, Texas, that area again down along the Rio Grande. Um, and you can see in Albany, um, again, uh, really uh, your a basic unconstrained um, uh, development uh, pattern here um, without a lot uh, contributing to a question of why this would be. Um, right, right. We were looking at basically road emissions only in the data. Okay. So um, the tier threes were moderately clustered, not closely clustered. As usual, state by state along the sprawl index, they were, um, we saw those same clusterings across all the scatter plots. Um, and at a general parallel with daily VMT. Fatal collisions per million people is, uh, I believe, the last one that we have on this, in the presentation here. We have a significant uh, regression line and regression model. You can see, um, as expected, as the sprawl index goes up, the fatal collisions go down. Um, we also looked at annual injury collisions per million people and property damage only collisions per million people. The um, injuries pretty much paralleled fatal collisions, just a little bit wider spread, um, and actually property damage paralleled injury fairly closely. We did have a few outliers that were different. Connecticut Beaumont moves up closer to the regression line here and for injuries and property damage. And Beaumont, Texas, which is quite high in the uh, fatal collisions, moves down um, for the injury and property damage. Um, similarly, uh, New York, Albany moves down. And um, Grand Rapids, Michigan moves up for injury and property damage. So there's, um, there's some parallels here uh, between them. Um, and there are some parallels to freeway lane miles as well, um, but uh, there are variations between them as well. And that's the, I just went over those, so I'm going to move on. Okay, so the results in general of what we found in all of these scatter plots. 
relationships between land use factors and transportation outcomes, as demonstrated in Ewing's 2000 Sprawl Index Allowance, still hold for 2010 data. In their 2014 analysis, the Ewing study, as I mentioned, was focused on health factors, and they did not actually look closely at some of these relationships in that study. And what we found by repeating that analysis on our, these 26 MSAs is that those same relationships do hold up. So improved, higher sprawl indexes are associated with more dense land use factors and more nodal land use factors. The relationships were significant between sprawl index and freeway lane miles, hours of delay, daily vehicle miles traveled, emissions, and safety, and the sprawl index. So we saw significant relationships between those transportation outcomes and the land use outcomes. Um, where we saw insignificance was arterial lane miles and public transit use. Um, and, and that, as we talked about, are probably related to factors that were outside of the um, analysis that we did. The models in general across the board were what we would call weak. They um, were not strongly aligning to the regression line, and yet they were indeed significant in most cases. All right, so other things. Um, so we talked about that's the relationship of land use to transportation outcomes. The other connection, that relationship we were looking for was the relationship of policy to land use patterns. So that's the colored dots versus the land use patterns. Um, so those relationships were less clear. We did see tier three MSAs generally clustering together across both the sprawl index and the specific variables. And that wild card uh, boulder, which in general clustered with those. So that's a very, very interesting finding. Those um, tier threes and boulder all had not only land use policy that constrains development, but they were very long standing policy, 1898, 1973, 1990, as compared to a lot of the other policies that have gone into place um, in, since 2004, 2006. Um, the states generally cluster along the sprawl index. So in general, all the MSAs in one state are going to be in roughly a, a range of each other on the sprawl index. That's a very interesting finding that really needs more investigation to understand better what it is that's driving that. Um, modeling to control for complex, complex and external factors is therefore recommended. So, Really, the next step is to try to understand these patterns that didn't really show um, much indication. What is it that is driving those patterns? Is it market demand, property values, um, and so on in that MSA that's driving those, those patterns rather than policy? However, the other side to that is that it would be great, since a lot of these policies haven't been in place very long, to look at this again in a few years after they've been in place longer, and we can see if there's a change in their effects. Okay, the third very brief part of this um, study was to look broadly at policy and the literature and the potential opportunities that exist with po in, in using policy to influence land use patterns and therefore in influence transportation outcomes. Um, so our very brief broad overview included reviewing ODOT's programs and funding mechanisms, um, ODOT and MPO agency programs, policies, processes, and funding, reviewing the balanced growth plans in Ohio themselves and their implementation plans, uh, reviewing both academic and agency research on outcomes of transportation policy, and um, identifying then a set of policies outcomes and benefits that could result from that. So this is all summarized basically in one diagram. Um, and I encourage you to look um, at the report eventually when it's available because there's discussion of each of these parts. But basically what we have is uh, interaction with local governments can generate, um, can encourage density and compact development and support a multimodal system. Things like compact development, uh, transit-oriented development standards, sidewalk and bike lane requirements, local plans that prioritize infill development, 
These are all the kinds of local policies that can encourage that density and nodality that we were talking about. What results from that then are community benefits and a, what we call a transit-ready built form, basically that dense nodal type of development that reduces things like VMT and also um, uh, is, is supportable for transit in a feasible way. So community benefits are things like reduced costs. We talked about all of those earlier in the presentation, reduced air pollution, um, and to increase tax revenue. A transit-ready built form is basically higher density, mixed land uses, walkable neighborhoods, and by definition, they are nodal in development pattern around those transit nodes. At the MPO level, the opportunity exists to encourage a nodal regional development pattern. So at the MPO level, you're not so focused on compactness as you are on that nodality. Um, there are opportunities for incorporating incentives into um, coordination with MPOs and local governments. Um, through regional plans, through balanced growth plans in particular, and so on. Both of those then result in transportation outcomes, and, and this is a result of literature review that has demonstrated the connection between these and benefits such as vehicle miles traveled, reduced fuel consumption, travel, reduced travel time, and enhanced connectivity between areas. Um, ODOT in specific has opportunities in their own programs and policies, and those all together then have the potential to generate transportation benefits. And I, this is again a slide that just summarizes what I just told you, um, which is that the opportunities exist both at the local level, the MPO level, and um, within uh, the state level decision making. So the conclusions and recommendations for the study then are that transportation benefits of compact nodal development are demonstrated in the literature. Our technical an analysis demonstrates a relationship between land use patterns and transportation benefits. And this is a really important point. When we demonstrate the, a, a significant relationship, that's what we are demonstrating is a relationship not necessarily the causality. I, you know, by doing the visual review of the scatter plots and the visual review of the aerial photos and other data that we use, we can draw up some possible um, conjectures about what that causality is. But without models that control for all those confounding factors, we cannot actually demonstrate that causality right now. Um, policy analysis demonstrated benefits the result from different policy approaches. Um, definitely more work is needed to do that control for external and complex confounding factors. And then finally, as I mentioned, especially we could use more time to allow the Tier 1 and Tier 2 policies especially to go into place for a while. Um, it is possible in 10 years that patterns will be more distinct than they are now. So in future study, we recommend that a model be designed or models and associated data identified to um, attempt to control for these external and complex factors. And at, as the third point, to conduct long-term research to evaluate the tier policy effects over longer periods of time. As an interim, there's a very important step that um, can be taken, which is on a site-level basis to develop case studies where data is collected prior to the project's development and afterwards, um, both on transportation outcomes and other population characteristics, the kinds of things that are included in the sprawl index and included in this study. So on a very short term, project by project basis, data could be collected and case studies developed to look at the effects of change on transportation outcomes. Um, this could be done more easily than waiting 10 years might generate data that could be used in, the long, in a longer, more longitudinal study and would give us perhaps some information early on about trends and patterns in Ohio. So that's, that's it. Um, I think we'll take questions at this point. Um, so people are to email questions to... I have not received any email questions. If you're on the phone, you may unmute your phone and ask a question if you have one, or we'll take them in the room.
So on those case studies you were just referring to, mm -hmm. who are good candidates to actually identify, design, and then review the, that kind of case analysis? Okay. Uh, the question was for the case studies we identified, who would be good candidates to identify, define, and, and collect the data, and so on? Um, I would say that um, a, a collaborative effort is probably ideal. Um, I would think that ODOT would have an interest in defining what types of projects would be of interest and what kind of impacts on, on them would be worth collecting data on, but the MPOs are going to have a lot of the data. And yet the local government, because it's a local, any project by definition is a local project, you would want them to be involved in helping to define the thing. So I, I think it's a real opportunity for collaboration. But um, the, you know, the, 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 what entity does the actual collection could vary depending on, for a particular project, who's got the data. Probably the MPO level might be a very good place to locate it as long as other partners are involved. Okay. It appears somebody is typing a question, so we'll wait until that comes through. Um, but in the meantime, the final report, a PDF of the PowerPoint, and the recording of the live webcast will be available on the research website, which appears on your screen. If after the presentation questions arise, feel free to email that to the research email, as you see on your screen, and we'll get that to the researcher team uh, to answer. And unfortunately, the recorded version of this will not, you will not see the plot on the scatter chart come up. Um, but they are on the original presentation. It was just something in the transition to the recording that um, removed them. So the question came in, and there is concern about the removal of MSAs from the population you studied. What do you think your results would show if you included all the MSAs? So, yeah, the question was, um, what would we see, what do we think we would see if we had included all 193 MSAs instead of the 26 we selected? Um, I personally think that given what I know, that half the states have no policy, I think we would see just as wide a mix here. Um, I, and I would also, I think what we have is probably fairly representative. The odd cards would be New York, Boston, the really old heritage cities with large, very dense areas. Um, I think that they might, um, you know, be somewhat off the charts in terms of, they, uh, we, I think we see a much wider range of uh, in, you know, lane miles traveled, BMT, we, we, the, the, the Y scale would be much wider, and so would the X scale be much wider. This right. is Jacqueline Jenkins. Um, just to follow up on that, because we took a sample, the power of the analysis is less than it could be. So the fact that we got significance in the regression analysis actually speaks well to our selection that we actually got a range of the values. Um, and it compares with the analysis that was done on the 2000 sprawl index, and the same relationships were found. So I'm fairly confident that our sample is a good sample from the total MSA. Thank you. No, so I think it should dilute uh, data. Uh, Right. Well, and and for Ohio, really, I mean, I, the the in, in, if you just look at the sprawl index, we eliminated the low lows and high highs. We were really more ranging around that middle value of 100, which has, I would think, the most potential to not show much significance. And the fact that it did, I think, is a is a good point there. And it is really where the Ohio, if you look, the Ohio group are right in the middle of the pack in most cases. 
So I think it's, it's, we felt confident that the MSAs we selected were very representative of conditions in Ohio. Do you think because Ohio is in the middle of the pack, do you think we are maybe a little more planned, more organized in planning and predicting uh, more accurately to what the rest of the country is doing? Well, I think where we are in the middle of the pack is in the middle of the sprawl index. Yeah. Okay. And all that says is that our land use patterns are not extreme. We are not extremely dense and we are not extremely sprawling. We're somewhere in the middle. The other point I should make with regard to policy is that for the purposes of this study, we were looking at um, policies that were likely to have been operative at the time the 2010 data was collected. So we, we chose for, for states where the policy changed over the last 20 years, we chose the policy that were in place roughly around 2006, 2005, you know, sort of about five years before that 2010 period. As a result, even though Ohio is a tier one policy state now, for the purposes of this study, Ohio is classified as a tier zero because um, the Ohio Balanced Growth Program itself did not begin implementation until 2009, and it even then took a couple years for some of those projects to start getting implemented. So we felt that it was more realistic to say, for the purposes of the scatterplot analysis, so that the operative policy was tier zero at the time. So that's one point I want to make. I think there were one or two other places where there were variations from the state 2014 policy, um, but that's all explained in the report. Any other questions coming in? Yes. Uh, in the final report, you talked briefly about what sorts of variables would need to be developed about cost, you mean cost to the transportation yeah. agencies? Yeah. Um, that one we have discussed a fair amount, and it's actually a very complex question because everybody divides up their budgets differently. Um, and it would mean delving into, in order to get apples and apples to compare, it would mean delving into agency budgets in depth and I guess it would be really a project unto itself. Um, it's likely that an initial look at that, and I'm going to ask Jacqueline to chime in. I'm going to. But <laughs> it's, it's likely that an initial look would simply identify ways that we need to start collecting data in order to track this in the future. Um, and that might be where it stands. So Jacqueline, what do you have to say? Yeah, so we, we took a quick look. Um, it would have been really nice to have dollar signs to actually look at the cost, the expenditures. But there's a couple factors that are in play. One, if we look at the condition of the road network and the maintenance that is needed, the number of projects that could be built that we have need for, doesn't mean that those are actually what the dollars are spent on because of where we are financially um, with the amount of dollars available for an over amount of needs. So just because it's spent isn't a really good reflection upon what is needed for the network, even just to maintain its, its status. Um, so that's, that's one factor that makes cost in itself really difficult to get. Then if you want to go down that road to get the actual dollar signs, the number of funding mechanisms um, and how they vary from agency to agency would have to be sorted out. So it's an extremely large project that has that cap on top that would basically impose a really large bias. Um, so I'm not sure what you would get out of that type of analysis. So that's why we went to the VMP and road miles traveled 
road miles gives us an idea of what has been spent in the future. It's out there, it's infrastructure, it's been invested in. And then what needs to be spent in terms of operations, maintenance, and so on. And so it's, it's, it's a very strong surrogate <coughs> and, and probably provides the best picture of the effectiveness of right. those types of investments. The other point that I would like to make in doing the state-by-state -state survey, um, and we, we uh, actually, in addition to reviewing data, we interviewed at least one person in each state, and we also in the MSAs interviewed at least one person, usually in an MPO, but often at state agencies as well, um, uh, to understand what was going on. And there were many of them that said, we have essentially had no new road development in years because of restricted budget. It's effectively limited our growth even though uh, there's no policy in place. So that's another confounding factor that's directly related to cost. It's almost like the budget limits rather, the budget drives what gets spent rather than the needs driving what's spent, which is yes. basically what, what Jacqueline was saying. Any other questions coming up? There's somebody typing, so we'll give it a second. Okay. on the term growth when there are several MSAs in the U.S. that are not actually growing, for example, Toledo, Cleveland, Pittsburgh, Detroit, Buffalo, Syracuse. The American planning profession, particularly transportation planning, has become growth management paradigm. But in places like Northeast Ohio, the population peaked in 1970 and has declined steadily since. Shouldn't we change the nomenclature and our focus to balance change or efficiency? Well, I think there's, I, the question was if we should be using the term balance change instead of balance growth in referral to uh, the fact that many areas are not growing, they are uh, stagnant in terms of their growth. I think there are different ways to interpret growth. I think um, places can grow without expanding their development, and that's really the point. Um, in fact, that's what we want. Um, in a balanced growth strategy. Um, growth is more related to, uh, I mean, we've used it kind of loosely in many different ways in this presentation, but um, growth can refer to economic growth, which does not have to imply a footprint expansion. It can also refer to a footprint expansion. And that's why in, in most cases here I use the term development patterns. In, doing, in describing what was happening. Um, but we did, in selecting the MSAs, we selected communities that are not growing or have negative growth, i.e. their GDP is not expanding or their population is not expanding. We included those with virtually flat um, population expansion and those with expanding population. So, um, you know, growth is kind of a loose term here, but I think it's, I think keeping that word growth in there is very important because economic growth is important to everybody and important to the state, and it does not necessarily have to have a footprint expansion. That's what Intel's about. All right, at this time we'll conclude the presentation. Thank you, everybody who attended, and to Kirby and the researchers for taking the time to be here. Um, again, visit the website for the final report and presentation, and email any questions that come up in the future to the research email on your screen. Thank you. Thank you.